Hey guys, Turk here. Hope you're having a great day. You guys know I love me some graphics cards, and then unfortunately, just over the past two years, we haven't been able to get our hands on these new GPUs in order to update our rigs. Both AMD and Nvidia have some sweet cards that can pump out some serious frame rates. And the cherry on top, both companies now have upscaling technology that can boost our frame rates even faster. But there's one technology that the market keeps pushing, but us gamers, we're just not buying that, and that is ray tracing. We've previously reviewed both companies' implementations of ray tracing, and to be honest, guys, I think the technology looks phenomenal. But there's no way to sugarcoat it. Ray tracing can drastically eat into your performance. But why is that? Today, we're going to be harnessing our inner Doctor Strange and activating our time stones in order to dive deep into why the performance impacts are as large as they are with ray tracing. In my AMD versus NVIDIA ray tracing video, we tested several different games and there were a few instances where we reported between 40 and 60% performance losses when we just turn on ray tracing. And on the surface, that is a huge performance hit. But before we get carried away, let's take a step back and answer a couple of basic questions real quick. What is frame rate? A game engine's job is to not only track the mechanics of the gameplay, but to present that visually to the gamer. Each frame is rendered by the graphical pipeline of the engine and presented to the screen. The rate at which that occurs is called frame rate. Similar to RPM of a fan and hertz of a CPU, frames per second is our broad classification of performance of a graphical solution. But not every frame is created equally. Over time, some frames take longer to render than others. The scene's complexity changes, the texture requires additional transformation, and many other operations can change the time it takes to render a frame. That measurement is called frame time. In turn, over a second, you can count each frame that is rendered, adding up each frame time and resulting in frame rate. An excellent way to visualize this is with a slinky. For a given size of a slinky, we always have the same amount of loops. However, depending on how the compression of the slinky behaves, the amount of loops for any unit of time can change. The overall slinky retains the same length, or the frame rate, but the time of each loop or frame can drastically change. So let's take this to the next step. As we introduce new features to the pipeline, such as ray tracing, we by definition are increasing the amount of time it takes to render a frame, and that in turn will decrease our current frame rate. Still with me? Let's take a look at a chart. On the bottom axis, we have our frame time, and on the left, we have frame rate. For this discussion, we're just using average uniform frame rates. When our frame times are incredibly short, our frame rates are incredibly fast. But as we start to increase even minor amounts of time to render our frames, our FPS takes a nosedive. In fact, from 240 FPS, by increasing our frame times by 4.167 milliseconds, we effectively cut our frame rates in half. But strangely enough, if we then take an additional 4.167 milliseconds to render another frame, we don't cut the performance in half. We only lose 33% of the frame rate. It takes even more time to see our frame rates get cut in half. And as we continue to add time to our frame times, our frame rates don't end up taking as large of a hit in performance. This relationship of frame rate versus frame time makes sense on paper, but how does this work out in a practical sense? Let's load up 3 d Mark's ray tracing demo and see what happens. In this test, we force the GPU into a scenario where the ray tracing component is the critical path, so any increases in the scene complexity will stress the ray tracing components of the GPU specifically. With the RTX 3080 and only two rays used for calculation, we see an impressive 246 FPS or an average frame time of 4.065 milliseconds. If we triple the number of rays for the calculation, we see the FPS tank by 64%. And as alarming as this sounds, that translates into a 180% increase in frame times. But keep in mind though that we tripled the render time complexity, so I expect to see a performance drop. And as we increase the complexity even further, doubling the number of rays to 12, our frame times increase from 11.4 milliseconds to 21.7 milliseconds, translating into a 91% increase in frame times, but it only results in a 48% FPS drop. Maxing out our rays to 20 results in an additional 15 milliseconds of render time, but that only sacrifices our frame rate by 18. 
Overall, this example shows clearly that by increasing our scene's complexity, our frame times increase and in turn decrease our average frame rates. Now, I went ahead and threw in my RTX 3070 and 3060 into the mix, and sure enough, the pattern still holds. It is interesting to note, though, that with these lower end cards, we don't see as drastic of a performance loss when we go beyond the six rays that are cast. But Turk, no one cares about 3D Mark. Synthetics don't really mean anything. <laughs> All right, guys, I get it. So let's try the same test out on some real games. Now, I've already showed you guys that I've got the RTX 3080, 3070, and the 3060. So I've got the entire range of NVIDIA's latest graphics cards. But for the first time on the channel, I present to you the AMD RX 6800 XT. I have been begging and pleading to get my hands on this graphics card, so I've only got it for a short time, so I really wanted to see kind of how AMD versus Nvidia really perform, but I'm throwing that on the table as well. We'll be playing Watch Dogs Legion, Wolfenstein Youngblood, Quake 2 RTX, and both versions of Metro Exodus. As for resolutions, I'm only going to be testing 1080p and 1440p because all the cards today should be able to play at that resolution. And for detail settings, we're going to be sticking to the high preset in order to keep things consistent. And I'm only going to be changing the ray tracing options within the game. Kicking off with Watch Dogs Legion at 1080p, we get above 100 FPS for each of the GPUs at standard detail settings. As expected, engaging ray traced reflections account for a 45, 33, 24, and 41% loss for each of the cards going from left to right. Interestingly, as we increase the level of detail of the reflection, we only impact the frame rates by at most 13 FPS. But when we look at this from an average frame time perspective, things aren't as doom and gloom as we previously saw. With the RTX 3080, engaging reflections only costs 2.7 milliseconds of additional render time, and even the RX 6800 XT only encounters an additional 5.4 milliseconds. As we saw in the 3D Mark Synthetic, we are sort of in the elbow of the graph, so increases in frame time are not as sensitive to frame rate. At 1440p, our complexity is increasing twofold. One, we're rendering more frames, forcing our GPUs to do even more work. And obviously, turning on ray tracing has its own impacts. As a result, we see 47, 46, 37, and 55% performance loss in frame rate with the improved reflections. With this much performance loss, we are effectively doubling our render times across the board. However, the stronger cards, such as the 3080 and the 3070, they're much less impacted by the performance degradation. Another interesting observation is that the 3060 without ray tracing costs an additional 3.5 milliseconds in order to render the additional 1.6 million pixel increase going from 1080p to 1440p. The more you know. Wolfenstein Youngblood tells the other end of the story. At 1080p, each of the cards today is able to pump out over 200 FPS at the high detail setting, ranging from 210 with the RTX 3060 all the way to 370 with the 6800 XT. However, hold on to your butts. Turning on ray tracing shows what we were warned about, losing 85, 119, and 142 FPS. All right, go ahead. I'll wait a minute while you pick your jaws up off the floor. Clearly, we are on the far left side of the steep slope from our 3D Mark chart, but what's amazing is just how efficient turning on RT is. On the high end, it costs about 3.24 milliseconds to enable the feature, while going back to Watch Dogs at the same resolution costs 8.2 milliseconds. Yet, we only lose 45 FPS with Watch Dogs, and here, we nearly double that by losing 85. Moving to 1440p, we see some of the cards shift to less perceived performance loss, while the most powerful cards continue to see massive raw FPS dips. Regardless, each card today still manages to maintain above 60 FPS, even with RT turned on, so id Tech 6 does a great job rendering this game. Quake 2 RTX is a glorified tech demo at this point, but seeing full path ray tracing implemented in a game is always an achievement to be proud of. Since this game revs above 1000 FPS with default settings, we're just going to be focusing on the global illumination setting. Excellent scaling is observed throughout the cards and settings, ranging from a comfortable 93 FPS all the way to a blazing fast 235. However, this implementation of RT shows AMD's weaknesses, with this $650 card being matched by a $400 card. But when we shift gears to average frame times, we see our initial chart in a different form. 
At the high end of the frame rates, our frame times are very low, with only a half millisecond increase, forcing FPS dips to 27. However, a 1.32 millisecond increase in frame times only impacts our playable frame rate by 13 FPS on the low end. 1440p shows a similar story, though we start to see the more flatter part of that 3D Mark chart from before. So how exactly can a game actually improve its ray tracing performance? Well, fortunately for us gamers, 4A did a huge service to the industry. They did provide the base Metro Exodus vanilla version where you can play on any kind of graphics card that's actually supported. But they then re-engineered and redeveloped their entire graphical pipeline and present us with Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition. This particular version of the game requires you to have a ray tracing capable graphics card, but by doing so, they can optimize their setup and improve the performance as well as the graphical quality all in the same package. So we're gonna be testing both of these games side by side and starting us off, we'll go with Metro Exodus vanilla version. At 1080p, we see a less substantial hit in performance than the other games today with 24, 23, 23, and man, AMD is slacking off with a 37% performance loss. This is great news as RT enhances the immersion of the game while maintaining frame rates above 60 FPS. But when it comes to frame times, we start to see how the enhanced architectures of the 3070 and the 3080 help propel this game forward. With the 3080, we are only penalized by 1.9 milliseconds, and on the 3070, we see an additional 2.35 milliseconds. The 3060 nearly doubles that time cost with 15.34 milliseconds of frame time. 1440p is a huge workload with only the strongest cards maintaining above 60 FPS across the board. It is good to see that the 6800 XT starts to shine a bit here, <laughs> even if we're doing it in a kind of brute force sort of way. Now let's look at the Enhanced Edition, which was redesigned with ray tracing in mind. For the 3060, we see very similar high setting performance, but with the 3070, 3080, and 6800 XT, we see marginal improvements for averages and 1% lows. This means that 4A games can optimize their rendering procedures to reduce the amount of time required to ray trace a scene. Or better phrased, they can provide a better visual experience at the same performance levels by optimizing their engine. Two thumbs up. Now, I did test a few other games, but I think you get the point. The faster we can render a game, the shorter our frame times, and shorter frame times translate into an overall larger frames per second. As always, we prefer consistent frame times, so actual gameplay will make your mileage vary. However, just the inclusion effects, including ray tracing, will require the engine to take more time to render a frame. If we have an incredibly fast frame time to start, any additional time will reduce our frame rates considerably. Faster paced games such as Doom Eternal, Fortnite, and Battlefield probably won't benefit from the aesthetics and most gamers will opt for higher frame rates instead. However, suppose we're running closer to 90 or 80 FPS. In that case, chances are good that a 60 FPS experience is highly achievable and in turn provides a more fluid and cinematic experience. With that in mind, many games are on the market that can be enhanced from the technology, and if you need additional frame rate, DLSS or FSR, where available, can help you buy back a bit of that performance. And that's the video, guys. I hope y'all enjoyed it. If y'all want to see some ray tracing in action, make sure y'all follow me over at twitch.tv slash theturk. I'm playing games on Wednesday nights and trying to start doing some more Saturday streams. That way you can get more extended versions of this type of content where I can go a little bit deeper into kind of the mechanics of what's going on rather than try to smash all this information into, you know, a, a 15 minute video. So guys, I appreciate y'all watching the video. I hope y'all have a great day. We'll catch you next week.